Amen. Thank you, music team, for serving us, and good job, congregation, singing together this morning. Welcome. Glad to see you here. If you're a guest with us this morning, my name is Jeremy McMorris, and it's my privilege to be the lead pastor here at Paramount. I know we've got a number of guests that are with us this morning, and I don't normally draw attention to guests, but we have a handful that are just really special guests with us this morning. Where's Pastor Gary Bledsoe? I I know he's in the room somewhere. Back. I, I just... There he is, there he is. All right, let's give him a hand. Many of you know <coughs> Brother Gary was the, was the music minister here at Paramount for a number of years, and you all know him far better than I do. It's always a joy. This is not my first time to meet him, um, second time to meet him, so I'm glad he's here. And then the Bordens are here, Lance and Carey and Emily Borden, our missionaries to Austria, are here this morning. They came, they came to surprise Pat and Pat on their 60th wedding anniversary. So congratulations to Pat and Pat as well. That's super exciting. And then um, some, some, some brand new folks to me this morning. Where's the Williams family? Ryan Williams. Where's, is he in the service this morning? I know he was in a Sunday school. The Williams family are IMB missionaries to where, brother? I forgot. Prague, Czech Republic. That's on the map somewhere. I know where that is. And let's welcome the Williams. <clears throat> they are, they're friends with the Felder family, and while our church does not directly support them the same way that we do the Bordens, our church does support them because they are International Mission Board missionaries, and um, you are heroes in our book, and we're glad that you're here with us this morning. Church family, forgive me. You're just going to have to help, uh, bear with me on my voice. I'm just, I continue to struggle. I, I got it back in the middle of the week and then am losing it again um, as of last evening. I feel good. I just uh, sound miserable. So I sound the way I look most of the time. Um, so I apologize for that. Uh, it is what it is. You may notice that there are some photographers walking around the room this morning. Maybe you haven't noticed that. That's good. Um, I've met a lot of visitors uh, that have been part of our church. If you look around the room this morning, you can see that the room is wonderful full. We praise God for that. And a lot of you are guests here with us this morning. And I've had interesting conversations with many, many of the guests as I'm in conversation with them. One of the things that they will say is, we checked out your website before we came to church. And if you're like me, for much of my ministry, I've kind of discarded the website, or not discarded it, but disregarded it as something that's kind of superfluous. You need to kind of have your service times and your address on there. But beyond that, uh, you know, does anybody really check it out? Well, let me assure you that 100% of visitors before they come and visit us here in person have checked us out on the web. And we want to make sure that our church website is the first, it's the front door, it's the first ministry that people are going to receive from Paramount. So we want to make sure that it's accurate, that it's attractive, that it reflects who we are well, that it has the pertinent information. And so uh, we are doing some work on the website. um, And uh, so some photos and video are necessary for us to get that um, stepped up just a little bit. So that's why they are here this morning uh, taking uh, photos and videos in our service this morning. Okay, And I also want to say one more word about um, the equip ministry <clears throat> that you heard Pastor Anthony talk about a couple weeks ago, and you've heard it uh, you've heard it announced every week over the last few weeks. But um, this this equip ministry is something that we are, as a church leadership, incredibly excited about. We we know that God has been, is, and will continue to grow Paramount Baptist Church. We expect that. We want that. We work toward that. And what that means is, as Paramount grows, we need more and more of you who are equipped to do ministry. More and more of you who are ready to jump into ministry roles around here. A large church doesn't need fewer people to do the work of the ministry. A large church needs more people to do the work of the ministry. And a large church needs people who know how to do the work of ministry. And so this equip class, it's two semesters, 10 weeks in the fall, 10 weeks in the spring. This is a class that's intended to prepare the saints of the Lord for the work of ministry. Anyone and everyone is welcome to attend. And I hope if you don't have plans from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Wednesday evenings that you would register and come to this. Um, We will work hard to make this worth your while. We are going to do our very best to teach you 
how to be well-equipped ministers of the gospel, well-equipped disciple, disciple makers, okay? So if you don't have something better going, I mean, I mean Netflix, okay, is not something better. If you don't have something better going, let me encourage you to take, um, take a swing at being with us um, on uh, starting September 4th um, on Wednesday nights at 6.30 here. You can re- register for that so that we can know that you're coming, okay? Now, Please take out your Bibles. Take out your Bibles and open them to 1 Peter chapter 5. We've got two weeks left here in the book of 1 Peter together. And then on September 8th, I am thrilled and excited to be launching a new sermon series called Paramount ID. On September 8th, we're going to be kicking off a lot of fun and exciting new initiatives and ministries and definitions. We're going to be walking you through what God has called Paramount Baptist Church to here in the next, uh, into the, as we walk into the future together as a church. We've got two weeks left here in the book of 1 Peter. So this morning, 1 Peter chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. So I encourage you to have your Bibles and iPads open as we look together into God's word. Peter's writing, he starts with the word so, which means he's connecting it to what he's already been talking about. He's been talking about suffering as a Christian. So, I exhort the elders, and elders is a good word. That's a a word for pastors, for the, the leadership of a church. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, <clears throat> shepherd the flock that is among you. So, so Peter, who is an elder, is telling the elders, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Father, would you please help us now as we look into your word to understand it, to be convicted where we need to be convicted and to be encouraged where we need to be encouraged. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It is college football time. Yes, right, I'm okay if you're excited with that. I probably pretend to be more excited about it than I am. I do pull for LSU. I could not name for you a single player on their roster this year. So it shows you what kind of fan that I am. LSU has a great mascot, right? We're the LSU Tigers. Mike the Tiger is the mascot of the LSU football team. Tigers are tough. Tigers eat other animals, um, right? Tigers are kind of at the top of the food chain. That's a good mascot. There are a lot of teams that have a lot of great mascots, most of the time when you're choosing a mascot for your team, you want something that's tough, right? An animal that like beats up other animals is usually a good choice for a mascot. Sometimes teams have mascots that are a little bit weird. I'm not saying whether or not a sod poodle is a weird mascot. (laughs) I'm just saying sometimes people have weird mascots. Am I going to hear about this later? Okay. Okay. Sometimes mascots are almost totally unintelligible. When, when my family lived in Greenville, South Carolina, the, uh, I don't know if it was AA or AAA baseball team there in Greenville was the Greenville Drive. I, I'm still not, there was a lot of automotive industry in the Greenville area, and so they called their team the Greenville Drive. What is a drive? How do you represent that on, um, on, on your jersey? They, they didn't. It was just Greenville Drive. Mascots matter, right? You want a tough mascot. There aren't any teams that I know of that are the sheep. 
Now you might say, what about the rams? Yeah, rams are still tough, right? Rams can survive on their own in the wilderness, right? They can butt other things with their horns and live in inaccessible places where wolves can't get them. Rams are tough, but sheep, sheep in and of themselves are a proof that evolution is not true, right? Like sheep don't survive, sheep don't survive. Sheep don't survive without a shepherd. Sheep don't survive without a shepherd. And in this passage, and there are many passages in the New Testament like this, in this passage we see that God is is giving us a beautiful picture. He's giving us a representation of something that's important for us to, to understand. It's important for us to get. He's reminding us as a congregation of people that we're sheep. And in God's wisdom and in God's plan, he has given sheep Leaders, elders, overseers, pastors, he's given sheep shepherds, under shepherds. And those under shepherds are responsible to shepherd the sheep toward the great shepherd. This passage makes that truth incredibly clear. And here's what's important. We're going to notice this a couple different places in this passage. While Peter is specifically talking to pastors... Right, And there's a dozen or more in this room, probably over 20, who either are currently pastors or have been pastors, retired pastors. There are more than that who are prayerfully considering whether or not God would have this as part of your future. You aspire toward pastoral ministry. And this passage is very specifically being addressed to those of us like that in this room. But Peter's addressing pastors, and he's doing something on purpose. He's addressing pastors in the midst of the sheep. He wants the congregation, he wants the sheep to know what faithful pastoral ministry looks like. He wants the pastors to know what good pastoring is, but he also wants the sheep to know what good pastoring is. The main point this morning of this sermon entitled Good Shepherding is this, the Bible defines a pastor's responsibilities and a pastor's rewards. The Bible defines it. It's not up to me and the pastors at Paramount to go back into a room and just kind of collectively sit together and figure out, now how should we do this? That's not how pastoral ministry works. God has made it clear how pastors are supposed to pastor and God wants the congregation to know how pastors are supposed to pastor. We're gonna notice two things in this passage together this morning. First of all, we're gonna notice a pastor's responsibilities. What is it that a pastor is supposed to do? I remember years ago in Dalhart, one of the young ladies in the youth group went to my wife at some point during the week and said, like, what does Jeremy do? Like, (laughs) he talks for 40 to 50 minutes on a Sunday What does he do the rest of the week? Not much, not much, very little. A pastor's responsibility, and then secondly, we'll observe together, a pastor's reward. First of all, a pastor's responsibility. We see in verses two and three in particular, very clearly, these responsibilities being laid out. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, as God would have you. That little phrase right there, nestled right in the middle of verse two, is an incredibly important verse. It makes it clear that God has a way that this thing is supposed to work. So let's just start in verse one and walk through these first few verses dealing with a pastor's responsibility. He, Peter starts with the verse with the word so. And that word so is connecting us back to the end of chapter four where he's been talking about suffering, right? Look in verse 13, suffering. Verse 16, suffering. Verse 19, suffering. Peter's addressing a group of people and he's saying, you're gonna suffer, I wanna get you ready for suffering and since that's coming, therefore, I want, I want there to be something provided for you Those of you who are going to suffer, you need to understand something. So, I exhort you. Peter's exhorting them. He's not commanding them. It's a little bit different. It's like a strong encouragement. I exhort you 
I exhort the elders among you. And, and we might read, and different translations might translate that word just slightly differently, but most of your Bibles probably have the word elder there. And for many of us, we didn't grow up in churches where that title in particular was used. And for some, there might be a little bit of, of discomfort or uncertainty, like elders. Is that, a, is that a good thing? What exactly is that? Like Mormons, some of them call themselves elders, and, and we know that some Presbyterian churches have elders, and, and then there's like the, the old people in my life, but I'm not allowed to call them elders. So like, what is this word? <clears throat> Don't fear the word elder. It is by far the most common used title in the New Testament to refer to the office of pastor. So, so the, the pastors that you have at Paramount Baptist Church can equally and legitimately be referred to as elders. It's not a scary word. It's not a bad word. In fact, just do a fun, quick little search on your iPad there. Look for the word elder or elders in your Bible, and it will search, and you'll find that there are many, 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 many places um, throughout the New Testament that uh, the office of pastor is referred to as elders in the New Testament. So Paul is saying, listen, I want to establish my cred with you for a minute here real quick. I'm one of you. I, I am exhorting the elders as a fellow elder. I'm, I'm one of you, and I'm also a witness to the sufferings of Christ. Remember, Peter was actually there when Christ was betrayed and when Christ was crucified and when Christ rose again. Peter was walking with Jesus through Jesus' earthly life. He knows what it is to suffer. He knows what it is for Jesus to suffer. He was a witness. He was an eyewitness to the sufferings of Jesus. And I'm going to take just a moment to address a little bit of a, of a side topic or a, a tangent here for a moment as we think about Peter's witness of the sufferings of Christ, remember what kind of witness Peter was during Christ's suffering. When Jesus was on trial, when Jesus had been apprehended by the religious leaders and was taken on trial and Peter was outside and, and warming himself by a fire, and was being asked whether or not he knew anything about this Christ. Do you remember what Peter did in those moments? Brothers and sisters, Peter, Peter not only witnessed the sufferings of Christ, Peter contributed. Peter contributed to the sufferings of Christ. We're going to talk a lot about pastors here this morning. And for some of you, maybe many of you in this room, <clears throat> you're aware that you struggle with pastors in general. Like, you, you don't really like pastors because pastors have failed you. Because pastors have contributed to your suffering. You don't trust them. You watch what happens to the, the megachurch pastors and the, the horrible implosion of character and ministries, and you just think... I'm going to steer clear of pastors. I love Jesus, and I know I'm supposed to be part of a church, but man, I'm not sure that I really want to do anything uh, that has anything to do with being connected with pastors. But brothers and sisters, pastors, pastors like Peter, they fail. So one of the reasons Peter is giving instructions to these shepherds is because we don't just automatically and naturally succeed. We do we do struggle like others. Pastors fail. Again, this is, this is still part of my little side. This is my side sermon. Okay, This is my uh, attachment sermon. It's not if pastors will fail you, but when. Brothers and sisters, it's not if I will ever sin against you as a pastor. I, I will. I will. I will disappoint. I will miscommunicate. I will forget, I will forget that you were having surgery. I will forget that I told you I would be there before you were having surgery. I will, and I will fail you in ways like that. That's just a small way. I'll fail you in bigger ways than that. Pastors will, in the last two weeks, I have twice had to go to, once to a person and once to a group of people and say, I was wrong, will you forgive me? I shouldn't have handled this that way. And you say, 
You only sinned twice in the last two weeks? No, that's just, those are just the only two times I was willing to admit it. <laughs> Life, even in the church, includes suffering, and unfortunately at times it includes suffering at the hands of its leaders. Which is why Peter, who had failed the Lord tremendously by denying him three times, who then, after Christ's resurrection, sits there on the shore with Jesus, and after having denied him three times, Jesus looks at Peter and says, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I love you. And Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I love you. And Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I love you. Three times after having rejected Christ, Peter reaffirms his commitment to Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, Peter failed, pastors fail, we all fail. The beauty of this is that pastors are not the ultimate authority in a church. There's my side sermon. I'm gonna make a few more references to that in a minute. He was a witness to the sufferings of Christ. There is there's also, though, as, as Peter is aware, I mean, he's bringing this topic of suffering up over and over throughout the course of the book of 1 Peter. He says, as well as, the end of verse 1, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Yes, it's hard now, but there's a day coming. There is a day coming when all tears will be wiped away, when all wrongs will be made right, when everything is broken, will be mended, when all of our, uh, the holes in our hearts are filled, when all of our longings are satisfied. Christ will come and glory will be revealed. Peter, throughout the book of 1 Peter, reminds those who are suffering to set their eyes on a day that's to come. 1 Peter 1, 13, preparing your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, verse 13, rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Peter's constantly calling our attention to what's ahead. So he's, he's saying, listen, I'm one of you, I'm one of you pastors, and I'm one of you suffering Christians. But I have a word for pastors. Here's, here's the first and primary word that describes the work of pastoral ministry. Shepherd the flock of God. Shepherd the flock of God. Pastors have a responsibility to shepherd God's sheep. And there's a way, there's a specific way to do it, and we don't have to guess at how that's to be done, right? I think for many of us, when we think of shepherds, right, we think, we think of some kind of soft guy with a little crook sitting on a grassy hillside with a bunch of, you know, precious white lambs at his feet. Shepherding involved far more than that. Think more like King David, right? I got to kill a lion today. Tomorrow I got to kill a bear. I got to travel with this herd of animals through the wilderness, keeping them alive, Pastors are shepherds. It's the primary descriptor in the New Testament for the work that pastors do. The word pastor is used one time in the New Testament to describe the office of the New Testament church leader. One time. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. It's the only place where the word pastor is used as a title to describe its elder everywhere else. I love the word pastor because it means it's a noun and a verb, right? A pastor pastors. A shepherd shepherds, primary descriptor. And, and so often in the church, so often in modern culture, pastors want to be something other than shepherds. We want to be business leaders. We want to be CEOs or life coaches or team coaches. We, we, want, we want something a little more glorious. We want to be leaders and visioneers and and culture shapers, but most fundamentally, the New Testament describes the work of pastoral ministry in terms of shepherding sheep, which often means field work and dirty boots. And by dirty boots, I don't mean just dirt. Dirty boots. Pastors are called to lead. Pastors are called to consider where their sheep are 
and where their sheep need to go. And with God's help, by God's grace, with the word of God as our GPS, moving a group of people forward into Christ's likeness. Pastors are called to protect, to identify the wolves in the world, to identify the wolves in culture, and to protect the congregation from those wolves, to provide for the congregation food and water and rest and protection. And so while a pastor may enjoy being in his office and quiet sermon preparation and the, the glory of sermon delivery, that's not all that makes up pastoral ministry. He gets his boots dirty by going on hospital calls, by making a call to a house where a concerned wife who is out of town is worried that her husband has fallen back into drug abuse while she's away by visiting the hospital for childbirths and visiting the hospital for stillbirths, by writing a letter to the wayward church member calling them to repentance, by confronting the young man who wants to marry an unbeliever, and on and on and on. This is the dirty boots of pastoral ministry. Pastors are called to go and be with the sheep and care for the sheep. We're called the shepherd, and there's another word in this passage that makes it clear of the, the duties of the pastor, exercising oversight, right there in verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. Now, some of you Greek word nerds here, let me, let me just point something out. This is super cool. All three words that are used in the New Testament to refer to the office of pastor are used in this passage. So I exhort the elders, right? That's the word presbyteros. You hear the word Presbyterian tucked away in there. That, that's, that's one title for pastors. The beginning of verse two, shepherd, that's the verb form of the word pastor. So uh, poimen is the word for shepherd. And then at the end of, um, or in the middle of verse two, exercise oversight. Again, that's the verb form of the noun episkopos. So you have presbyteros, Poimen and episkopos, all three used in these two verses referring to the office of pastor. Pastor, elder, overseer, all wonderful terms referring to the work of pastoral ministry. Okay, that was just for you word nerds. There's like two of you in here, and I know who you are, so you're welcome. Now, back to the common tongue for the rest of us. Pastors are to oversee to, to watch over, to, to exercise oversight over the flock of God. <clears throat> we, we, you, we as sheep, we like oversight sometimes. We like oversight in certain areas some of the time. You hire a financial advisor to provide oversight for your finances. You go to a doctor to provide oversight for your physical health. You have a gym membership and a coach to provide oversight for your physical health. We, we like oversight in lots of areas. Pastors are given by God to the sheep in order to help provide oversight in your life. Here's what a pastor is doing. A pastor if he's doing his job responsibly and well according to the word of God, as he provides oversight and shepherding in your life, he is taking your life and constantly trying to draw a line between you and the Savior. Hey, look at Jesus. Hey, hey, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Are you, are you growing to become more like Jesus? I want you to grow to become more like Jesus. Look at Jesus. Your life, hey, hey, sheep, sheep, listen to me. Your life's not looking like Jesus right now. In fact, you've got your head turned away from the great shepherd and you're working your way away from him. And because God has given me the responsibility to provide oversight in your life, I have to come to you and say, stop. We don't like it when pastors do that. We don't like it when anybody does that. Right? Who are you to tell me, well, hold on a second, they're, they're a pastor. They're actually supposed to. They're actually supposed to because Hebrews makes it clear that we as pastors actually answer to someone greater than the church council. Yep, to the king himself. 
There's no passage in Scripture that is more sobering for me than that passage in Hebrews that reminds me that there will come a day, and I don't know what it's going to look like, but there's going to come a day where I'm going to stand before God, and he's going to say, okay, Jeremy, how well did you pastor Ernie McNabb and Janice Hughes and Franklin Smith? How well did you, like, there's going to be some kind of accountability that I'm going to have to give to God for the oversight of this church. I mean, and, and I'm, just, I'm not just speaking for me right now, right? Like I got other, I mean, I'm, my pastor brothers are all scattered around the room here this morning. This goes for all of us. We're to watch out for wolves. We're to look into the future. We're to evaluate where we are, where you are, where we're going. We're to watch over, to oversee the flock of God that is among you. Oversee, exercising oversight. And then, The end of verse two and the beginning of verse three, or all of verse three, describes some ways that we're to fulfill this responsibility of shepherding oversight. You'll notice that there are three phrases that begin with not and have but in the middle. Not but, not but, not but. Look again, middle of verse two. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering, but being an example. I skipped one. Not under compulsion in the beginning. Not under compulsion, but willingly. Let's just take a quick second to walk through those. Not out of duty, but willingly. One pastor says, men who serve only from a sense of duty will not have the requisite love necessary for God's people to flourish. Pastors must want to shepherd people. They need to be men who are called by God. Men who, as Charles Spurgeon would say, who can't do anything other than this. This is, this is, this is what it means to do it not out of duty, but willingly. Secondly, not for money, but eagerly. Right? Not, not for shameful gain. That's what shameful gain is referring to money. Not for shameful gain, but money where the primary motivation is the spiritual growth of God's people. I think that men who serve the church as pastors should be men who would do what they're doing whether you paid them to do it or not. Do you know how I think we should identify and find the next generation of pastors? You just start looking for people who are doing it. Who, who are the men who are giving themselves to carefully teaching the word of God, carefully discipling God's people? They're, they're looking for ways to fit discipleship of others into their lives in the nooks and crannies of their life. They've been called by God. They've been equipped by God. They're doing this work of ministry, whether you paid them to or not. We, I love the way one a friend of mine says it. We pay pastors to not have jobs so that they can give their lives to shepherding and overseeing God's people. Not for money, but eagerly. Not for domineering, but as an example, as examples. Not, not, not to be dictators, but to be examples. I've known pastors whose pastoral ministry was, was marked more by like this extreme authoritarian dictatorship and not like shepherding servants of God's people. Pastors are called to be examples, right? There it is, the end of verse three, but being examples to the flock, examples to the flock of God. Pastors should be examples in how to live their Christian lives, in how to live Christian lives. Pastors are not perfect, and even in pastoral imperfection, there should be an example there. When pastors sin, do they repent and move forward again? If a pastor sins and repents, he's setting an example of how the Christian life works. That, that's what he's doing in that moment. Pastors should be examples of what it is to live lives that are full of happiness because of the gospel. Pastors should be men who live lives that are full of humility because of the gospel. Pastors should be, lives whose, uh, uh, should be men whose lives are marked by holiness because of the gospel. Happy, humble, and holy. Pastors should be men whose lives are marked by these things. 
But I actually think when Peter says that pastors are to be examples to the flock in this passage, he's thinking of something very specific. Peter's been talking about suffering. And I think pastors are often lead sufferers. Pastors are not perfect. But they should be an example, a model model to follow even in suffering. Yes, in great persecution, when the world comes against Christianity and says recant or die, the pastors are the ones whose arms are lashed to the stake and as the flames grow up around them, they sing hymns of the faith as they enter into the presence of Jesus. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs and there are stories and story, story after story and there are even modern martyrs today who around the world are giving their lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. And yes, pastors are Examples should be examples in that kind of suffering. But, but pastors, brothers and sisters, pastors are also suffering in the more germane and mundane ways when, when a pastor loses a loved one, when a pastor has a wayward child, when a pastor suffers physically, when we struggle and fall because of our sinfulness. We can be lead sufferers One of the ways a flock learns how to suffer is by watching its pastors. That's not my favorite part of this verse, by the way. Pastors are setting an example even in their suffering. And notice this. In verse 3, Peter calls the congregation, he he refers to them as those in your charge, to, to not domineering over those in your charge, but being in example to the flock. There's something that I haven't addressed yet in this passage that's incredibly important for everyone to understand. It is the absolute assumption throughout the New Testament, if you are a follower of God, if you have been saved, that you are part of a local church and under pastoral authority. That's the assumption that the Bible makes all through the Bible, especially in the pastoral epistles, and Peter is writing it here as well. There's the expectation, there's the assumption that you as a flock are among pastors, that that the Christianity that you're living is not some kind of Lone Ranger Christianity where you kind of got saved and got into God's family, but you have nothing to do with the church and you don't want to really hang out with those people and you sure don't want pastoral authority in your life. And man, I can worship Jesus even better out on the lake on the weekends or on the golf course on the weekends, right? I can do it. No, that is not the picture that is given to us of believers who are following Christ. The New Testament makes it clear that there is a flock that is known by its shepherd and a shepherd who is known by its flock. One of the reasons, one of the main reasons we have at Paramount a formalized church membership is because as pastors, we know we will give an account to God and I want to know who I'm responsible for. I want to know who am I going to answer for. And if you don't show up for a while, we need to make sure that we have um, systems in place to go, hey, hey, where have you been? What's going on in your life? Are you, is there suffering that you're going through? Are you running away from the shepherd? We want to call you back into that. It's important that all of us, the under shepherds included, are part of being part of the sheep. Now, there are men in this room who I know are desiring for pastoral ministry in the future. You have that in your heart. You, you wonder if God has you being a pastor in the future. And so let me just ask you this. What is it about pastoral ministry that you want? What is it that you want in pastoral ministry? Is it, is it that you want these things and you're willing to give your life to these things? Or is there something about shameful gain, money, or pressure, expectations from family members, or pride of life, a desire to be thought of in a certain way? Brothers, those things will not carry you in pastoral ministry. They will not carry you in pastoral ministry. Secondly, a pastor's reward. Look in verse four. And when the chief shepherd appears, you, pastors, will receive the unfading crown of glory. 
Brothers and sisters, the Bible offers a motive, an incentive, a reward for faithful pastoral ministry. I mean, that's clear. It's kind of weird for me to be the one telling you about it, but it's just right there. A pastor's reward. Why would Peter, after writing a book full of suffering, and then telling pastors, hey, by the way, you're going to be an example to your people in how to suffer. And I want you to shepherd them. And I want you to oversee them. I want you to care for the flock of God that is among you. Why would Peter end this part of his talk toward pastors with this mention of reward? Well, first of all, I'm going to say this. There is nothing on the planet I would rather do than be the pastor of Paramount Baptist Church. I love being your pastor. <clears throat> And it is overwhelmingly fun and a joy. But there are some times where it's hard. There are some times where it's hard. <clears throat> On Monday mornings, <clears throat> excuse me, every Monday morning I get an email that shows up in my inbox from a ministry called Practical Shepherding. It's run by Brian Croft, excellent pastor. Uh, he's actually now, uh, his ministry is a, a ministry to pastors. And so his email comes out on Monday mornings and it's got you know, a bunch of pastoral articles and wisdom in it, that sort of thing. But the first line of his email to pastors every Monday morning is this. It's Monday, pastor. Don't resign today. <laughs> every week, every Monday, he says, it's Monday, don't resign. And, and that's in part because for many pastors, many pastors do not enjoy the incredible love that I get to experience here and that we as pastors at Paramount get to experience here. This is, I talk to a lot of pastors and we have an unusual thing going here. I believe it's a kindness from the Lord. I believe God's spirit is at work here and that his love is the number one thing that's happening in this room Sunday after Sunday and throughout the week and as, we, as we gather in much smaller gatherings throughout the week. Why would he write that? Well, he writes that because he knows pastoral ministry. And he knows that for many pastors, Monday morning, they have drafted a letter to their deacons. And he wants to encourage them. And he'll use passages then like this to remind them, listen, there's a reward coming. The same thing Peter's been doing all through the book. You can endure suffering right now. There's a reward coming. Is how Peter is assuring the elders, the shepherds, the overseers. He's assuring them with that same promise to something to come. There's a day coming when the chief shepherd will show up, when the chief shepherd will arise, will arrive. I love that title, chief shepherd. It's the only place in the New Testament it's used. One theologian says, Jesus here is called the chief shepherd. Shepherd. It's a rare term that occurs nowhere else in the New Testament. The designation of Jesus as the chief shepherd reminds the leaders that they are fundamentally servants. Their positions of leadership are a responsibility, not a privilege by which they advance their own status. You know what it does for me as an under-shepherd to know that there's a chief shepherd? Man, does it make me relax. It makes me think, man, I, I, at the end of the day, Paramount Baptist Church is not Jeremy McMorris's church. It wasn't Andrew Abair's and it wasn't Gil Lane's. And I'm thankful for those men, you know that. This church belongs to Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd. He has a plan for it and he is working it out. And as under shepherds, there are many of us here at Paramount who are the under shepherds, we're the pastors here at Paramount. It is a great relief to us to know that there is a chief shepherd and he's coming. And he who has begun a good work in you will perform it. He surely will do it. There's a chief shepherd and he's coming back and he's coming back with a prize. The chief shepherd will appear and you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, there are other 
crowns that are referred to in the New Testament. There are other prizes that are referred to for all of God's saints in the New Testament. But I think, someone correct me later if I'm wrong, but I think this one's special for pastors. I'm I'm okay with that. An unfading crown of glory for under shepherds who shepherd people toward the chief, the chief shepherd. He's coming with a prize. In, in ancient times, a, a, a laurel wreath would be given to the victor of some type of game, right? We just went through the Olympics and they get their gold medals. That's not what they would have gotten 2,000 years ago, right? A, kind of a, a laurel wreath made out of living, uh, you know, some kind of vegetation of some sort, and right? You put it on your head and after a week or two, I guess it, it's done, it's gone, it goes away. And here, there's an unfading crown. There's an unfading crown of glory that will be brought. And we'll wear that crown of glory because he wore a crown of thorns. The chief shepherd made a way for the under shepherds to bring the sheep home again. See, brothers and sisters, friends who are visiting with us here this morning, pastors don't pastor people to suppress them into living according to a religious code. That's not why I'm shepherding. That's not why I'm overseeing. It's not so that we gotta keep everybody behaving. We gotta make sure that everybody's doing the Ten Commandments every week. And if you don't obey the Ten Commandments this week, we're gonna get you. That, that's not what shepherding and overseeing is. Shepherding is moving someone from one place to another place. And overseeing is making sure that they get there. We're wanting to get those of us who have broken relationship with God back into relationship with God. The gospel is the reason shepherds shepherd. Jesus Christ came and lived for 33 years and he perfectly kept all of the law of God. He lived the perfect Christian life. The life that you and I have failed to live, Jesus lived perfectly for us. And then the end of his 33 years, Jesus went to the cross, and on the cross, he bore on in himself the wrath of God against sin, and he paid for sin. And three days later, he rose from the grave, proving that he defeated sin. And those of us who will repent of our sin and put our trust in Jesus to be our Lord and Savior will be saved. We will be born again. We will be converted And that's how we come into relationship with the chief shepherd. And now as we live this life, we we take step after step after step, moving toward, following toward the chief shepherd. And under shepherds have been given the task, have been given the responsibilities of shepherding and overseeing the sheep on their way to the chief shepherd. Mascots are cool because they're tough. We are sheep. We're sheep who need a shepherd. And God in his wisdom says, church, I want you to know something. I want you to know that I've given you under shepherds. Those under shepherds are to operate in a certain way. Here are their responsibilities. Here's their reward. Now follow them toward the chief shepherd. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes and we'll conclude our service It's hard to trust in pastors, isn't it? Pastors aren't perfect. Thankfully, you don't have to finally and ultimately trust in a pastor. You trust in the chief shepherd. You trust in Jesus. And you can trust pastors who are seeking, by God's grace, to get you toward him, the chief shepherd. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you can call upon him and be saved today. You can know Jesus to be your shepherd. If you'd like to talk with someone, there'll be pastors here at the front and at Guest Central, both during the time where we pray and after the service, we'd be happy to visit with you and pray with you and talk with you about that. For the rest of us in this room, if if you're not part of a church, I encourage you to find a church that preaches the Bible and that has pastors that will help you follow the chief shepherd. For all of us in here this morning, let's give consideration for just a moment to what kind of sheep we've been. Are we following? Have we put our trust in the chief shepherd? 
Are we utilizing the ministry of under shepherds in order to help move us in that direction? Father, please use your word in our hearts and lives this morning. We pray in Christ's name, amen.